When the iPod first came out, it was, of course, Macintosh. Only fans, younger people, urban people began to see for the first time these white earbuds. White earbuds. No company had ever cared before about the color of the darn earbuds. But all of a sudden, that became a symbol, and people are like, what is that? They made the earbuds white. Um, just because the player was white, they wanted to keep it consistent with the color of the player. But it turned out to be a brilliant piece of marketing because it advertised a player that's normally hidden in a pocket or a backpack, something that's invisible, something you don't see, uh, and it made it very visible. Hey, you're walking down the street, you see a cool person, and you see some visible accessory that you've never seen before. And you think, what's that, and why is that guy wearing it? And then you see it again, and then you see it again, and then suddenly you start taking notice that every person I see with those white earbuds is a cool-looking person. And then you start really wanting it. You want to be part of that community. Now, Apple picked up on that and noticed that the cool people had the white earbuds, and they began to put it into their advertising. White earbuds became the hero, the piece of iconography that said, this is who we are, and you belong if you have one of these. With the iPod, the word of mouth messaging, you know, it was coming from that cool DJ that was using it at a party, you know, or the fashion designer who's designing a line of accessories for the iPod. And that's what gave it its legitimacy. Sensing its growing popularity, the media jumps on the iPod bandwagon and makes this little white device front page news. While iPod sales continue to ramp up, Steve Jobs turns his attention to selling digital music. With MP3 sharing giant Napster now out of the picture, the record industry scrambles to figure out a way to sell their music online. After they sued Napster out of existence, the record companies were on their defensive. The public wanted digital music, and the record industry wasn't winning any points by saying no, no, no. There were never any statistics released just exclusively about losses for Napster. But in a period of about three years, the industry went from almost $15.5 billion a year in annual sales to about $12.5 billion. So when you are in a world where everybody says your business should be expanding because of these great digital opportunities, it was a pretty devastating time. And in a world where people were used to getting all of their digital music for free, figuring out how to get consumers to pay wasn't going to be easy. Nobody really knew what distribution business model was going to work, whether it would be selling downloads, selling albums, or subscription services. The few businesses that had started a subscription weren't doing very well. While the individual labels and other technology companies begin conversations to launch their own initiatives, Steve has a different plan. An online music store where millions of songs from every record label would be available for purchase. Users would buy them and seamlessly transfer them onto their iPods. Steve, I think, understood in a, in a way that very few people did. That you wanted to own your own music. It was your music. You bought a CD, it was yours. The great idea of the record industry was that you were going to buy a subscription to their music. And as long as you paid, you could listen to the song. But if you stop paying, you lose it. So essentially, you were renting music. Steve told them from the very beginning this was a brain-dead idea. Actually, the labels were not interested in doing a deal with Apple at all. And to understand why, you kind of have to look at the relationship that happened between labels and MTV about two decades earlier. So MTV took off as this little startup, this, this company that could only show videos. And what ended up happening over the next two decades was that MTV basically became the power broker in the music industry. So the thinking when Apple came along was, well, why are we going to create this other powerhouse outside of our building? We don't want to do it. But the recording industry learned that Steve Jobs is not an easy man to say no to. I think his intensity and charisma and just selling this thing was really important. I mean, he was an evangelist like none of the other tech companies had. You know, Microsoft would send their, you know, VP of doodads into meetings with music folks. 
there aren't too many computer industry CEOs that artists are able or willing to sit down and talk to. But Steve, people wanted to meet. The labels are intrigued with Steve and his pitch, but there's one sticking point. Steve wants to sell individual songs at 99 cents a pop, while some of the record companies and their artists demand he sell albums in their entirety. It wasn't so much that the record companies believed that Steve had the model with selling singles. It's that Steve believed he had the model. And what he said to them was, I want to do this. And the only way I'm willing to do it, if you let me tear these albums apart, you two, they said, no, we create concept albums and we want you to sell our whole album. And literally Steve and Bono and, and The Edge, they all spent time together and Steve convinced them to give his idea a try. And ultimately, you know, Bono and U2 became one of the iPod's greatest salesmen. On April 28, 2003, after months of exhaustive wrangling with executives and artists, Apple launches the iTunes Music Store with more than 200,000 songs from all five major labels. Steve's idea has become a reality. Steve made this his personal mission, and he pushed those record company CEOs to make it theirs. At one point, there was a new prototype of the music store coming out. He hadn't seen it yet. His staff was about to present it to me. He got distracted for literally a half an hour talking about the font size and the location of like three words on the home page. It was the most intense level of detail I've ever seen from a CEO. It was both impressive and kind of shocking. In many ways, launching the iTunes Music Store was actually a bigger accomplishment than launching the iPod in terms of the complication. So many different details for one song. There could be five different rights holders, and all of those people have to come to the table. Everyone has to sign the dotted line, and then to take all of that licensing to put it into a format that has one price. This is really Herculean. Steve's hard work pays off. Within just five days of launching the iTunes Music Store, Apple sells more than a million songs. Steve Jobs and Apple had accomplished something no other company had done. Offer consumers a digital music player with its own dedicated music store. That very same day, Steve would make another announcement that would help send the iPod into the stratosphere.